Hey folks, Matt Easton here. So I have an account uh, which is featured in Swordsman of the British Empire by D.A. Kinsley, which uh, features an introduction by me as well. Um, and it's from the um, Battle of Waterloo, um, but it's recited by Reverend G.R. Gleig, or Gleig, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, in 1848, so some, some decades later. But it's an interesting account um, that just kind of sounds uh, sounds true to me. Remember, with all history, you don't always take history at face value. Sometimes there's um, there's an agenda in there. Sometimes it's just an outright lie. Sometimes it's an apocryphal story. Sometimes it's Chinese whispers. You know, there's many different uh, reasons why history comes down to us the way it, it does. Um, but in this case, it sounds like a true account, and it features a couple of swords, which I'll just show now before I read the account. So. First up, it makes um, it's to do with a fight between a, a British officer of the 95th Rifles, who's a, a Scotsman, as it happens, and it describes that person of the Rifles as using a, uh, a as they describe a crooked saber. What they mean by that is something like this. This is actually a 1796 light -like cavalry saber, but um, officers, particularly of Rifles. Um, at this time, so any of you who watch Sharp, for example, featuring Sean Bean, will know that he uses a heavy cavalry sword, which is not very accurate at all for an officer of rifles, but it's part of the story. Um, what officers of rifles normally used at this time, actually, was not the spadroon, which was still the regulation sword, in fact, um, although there was the flank officer sabre which came in the 1803, but they used various forms of sabre that were inspired by and modelled by the 1796. So called crooked um, because it was bent, because it's curved, because it's a curved sabre. And it was very fashionable for, you to, for them to use these types of swords. This is a cavalry length one. They tended to have slightly shorter blades. So this is a 33 inch blade. The uh, infantry officer's versions tend to have more like 30, 31 inch blades, sometimes even shorter. Um, I've got another sword here, um, which I've shown before. This is a hanger. So again, it's a, it's a sabre, uh, but this is an even shorter one. And sometimes you find naval officers and, and sometimes even infantry officers with swords more of this size. Um, but anyway, so uh, he, the, the British officer or Scottish Highland officer in this case, but not of a Highland regiment of the 95th Rifles, was using a sabre and the Frenchman, in true French style, was using a small sword. Now we will note in a second that the source actually refers to um, him using a rapier, uh, but within a kind of 18th, 19th century context, when you read rapier, if it's in a, if it's in a, usually anyway, if it's in a, a, an original source from this kind of period, when they say rapier, they actually mean small sword. The word itself, much like the word Damascus in uh, modern usage, which these days the people are actually talking about pattern welding, not real Damascus. That's for another video. Um, but much like that in the 19th century, when they said rapier, they usually actually meant a small sword, not a rapier. Although, the, to caveat that, there are some sources, for example, if you get Alfred Hutton, for example, talking about rapiers, he actually does mean a rapier because he knew what he was talking about, but most people didn't. Reverend G.R. Gleig, The Story of the Battle of Waterloo uh, from 1848. This is a, a section of that. Um, and it commences... A tall, powerful Highlander, Lieutenant John Stewart, um, who was of the 95th Rifles, made himself conspicuous um, by a hand-to-hand -hand encounter, which, had he been less active and resolute, um, must have proved to be his last. During one of those lulls, which occur in, in all actions, um, Stuart and his men lay in skirmishing order behind a hedge. Uh, so they're hiding. <laughs> and uh, about 60 or, um, or 100 yards in front of them, uh, lining in like manner uh, in another ditch or hollow, was a body of uh, French uh, tirailleurs, um, and they had, they had taken post in that ditch. Um, and each party continued for a while to watch the other without molesting each other, um, without harassing each other. At last, a French officer rose out of his own ditch, and either because he really desired to encourage his own men, or for the matter of bravado, advanced some space um, into their front, waving his sword around, sir. He's holding a small sword, waving his sword around. 
it would have been easy enough to pick him off um, for the rifles uh, riflemen uh, <laughs> needed no instruction as marksmen in those days um, but Stuart would not permit that um, the officer uh, the Highland officer Stuart would not permit that on the contrary his 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 orders were men keep quiet while he himself sprang through the hedge and ran to meet the French officer. The latter did not shun the duel. He too was a tall and active looking man. Um, uh, and in his rapier, so small sword, in his rapier he had the decided advantage over Stuart. Uh, Stuart being armed with a very crooked sabre. <laughs> so one of these. Um, and uh, which, which it was the fashion in those days for officers of the Rifle Corps to carry. Indeed, very true. I can verify that. Um, the combatants met, and so badly tempered was Stuart's weapon, the sabre, that at the first pass exchange, uh, his blade broke off, not, not very far from the hilt, leaving a little bit of blade just above the guard. The Frenchman saw his advantage and prepared to use it. He flourished his sword as in defiance and made a lunge at his opponent's body, which, however, the Highlander received in his left arm. Mmm, echoes of Rob Roy here. <laughs> this is exactly like the final duel in Rob Roy, isn't it? It's quite cool. Um, and incidentally, we see exactly this kind of thing happening. Sharp, again, Sharp seems to take people's swords into his body several times and then cut them down. Um, and before a second thrust could be administered by the Frenchman, the two men closed, uh, i.e. grappled. Um, it was a struggle of a moment and no more. Stuart bore his enemy to the earth and with the broken piece of his sabre, so the remaining bit of blade, slew him. Um, so, you know, I think that's really interesting for a number of reasons. It, 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 I, I can absolutely verify it was typical um, in this period for French officers to use, if not necessarily a small sword, a form of narrow thrusting sword. Sometimes spadroons, sometimes... Um, sometimes small swords and other types of um, other types of thrusting sword was it was very much de rigueur uh, for French officers to have thrust centric swords in the Napoleonic era whereas absolutely true it as mentioned it had become very fashionable in the British army for um, infantry officers to start carrying sabres that emulated the styles of like cavalry sabres uh, and again sometimes it was shorter versions like the hanger. This actually does go back further. Um, standard literature on this subject will sort of say that sabres became popular during the Napoleonic period. In reality it seems that hangers in particular, in other words these, these kind of like almost like a short falchion, had actually become popular amongst British um, officers earlier on in the uh, American War of Independence, for example, in the sort of 1770s. So it seems like there was an existing tradition of use of cutting swords in the British Army. In fact, we find many sources referring to the fact that um, the British as a race, as the 19th century viewed it, were natural choppers, natural hitters, and not natural thrusters. And it is very often um, described for right or wrong, in 19th century sources that the Germanic races were natural cutters and the Latin races, French, Italian, Spanish, were natural thrusters. Um, in, in the most basic sense of, uh, of this, it, it's actually hard to argue with that point. Or clearly it doesn't have any genetic um, kind of... Uh, cause um, but it, it for whatever reasons cultural reasons the the way that fencing developed in different regions and different countries it does seem that by the 19th century there is a general rule that generally speaking thrusting styles of swordsmanship seem to have originated by and large in France Italy and Spain whereas in Britain for example we would use Britain as a, as a single example the the back sword the cutting sword generally seems to have maintained its popularity and um, kind of fought against the thrusting the foreign thrusting styles that had come in so in the Napoleonic period to a, a person who wasn't necessarily well versed in the history of fencing who looked at it they would go well yeah there is a tendency for the use of small swords for example in France and there's a tendency for the use of sabres and back swords in Britain um, and, and certainly that is demonstrable. Um, so anyway, it's interesting as well that it's a Highland officer, but in the 95th Rifles. So 
it's not a Highlander using a basket hilted broadsword or anything like that, but he is using a cutting sword, in this case a very curved sabre. Actually a style of sword that was popular right the way across, unofficially, right the way across uh, British officers in all different regiments. Even incidentally in some Highland regiments where the officially the official officer's sword was the basket hilted claymore, as they called it at the time, uh, the, the one-handed basket hilted broadsword. Um, uh, even in some of those regiments, the officers chose to use sabres rather than their basket-hilted um, broadswords for a number of reasons that I might uh, sort of look at in a, in a future video. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, it's an interesting encounter, but also the fact that Thrust, it again highlights, as in so many of the sources I read, again highlights the, the risks of Thrust, that if that Thrust doesn't kill your opponent and gets lodged in the person's body, you're essentially disarmed. So if you are willing, and this goes for knives as well, if you are willing to sacrifice a probably non-fatal part of your body, like an arm or a leg, to a sword thrust, then uh, and close in on the person, in the time that that blade is embedded in some part of your body, that weapon is no longer useful to the person holding it. Um, and indeed, you can, whether you've got a broken sword or a complete sword, you can then um, go to work on them with your edge or pommel or whatever you've got left. Um, so, a very interesting account, and also I think it's interesting that it echoes certain, some of what we see in movies and TV um, in more recent times, and shows that actually some of these events that we see, whether it's in Game of Thrones or Rob Roy or Sharp, some of these encounters we see in dramatizations actually have a basis in things that did actually happen in the 19th century and earlier. Um, so there we go. I hope that was an interesting account and I'll see you for the next video. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.